Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another episode of Full Metal Tuxedo Podcast. My name is Gregory, your host. Now, I've got, of course, a lineup of viewer stories to read off at the end of tonight's episode. I'm not really sure exactly how long the first half of this is going to go. It might be kind of short, but I don't know. I feel also like I have a lot to say. Like any episode, it doesn't really matter what I say. The topic of the episode is, chances are I'm going to end up rambling about something just semi-related to that for a good deal of your time. But, uh, I know you're cool with it. Uh, remember, if you want your story to be read, I'm still thirsty for stories. I've got about four or five of them tonight. But send them to fullmetaltuxedo at gmail.com. Just tell me what you want me to call you. You'll get the gist of it when I read them off at the end of the episode. I want a first-hand or second-hand account of something crazy, strange, bizarre, unexplainable that's happened to you. But of course, I also like super chats if you're listening to this live. I do this every other Saturday night, live on the Armored Gregory YouTube channel. And then I later upload it semi-edited to the Armored Skeptic More channel. I know, very, very complicated. <laughs> I know I got a few in the Discord there. I have a separate Patreon for the podcast. I know that's also very confusing. But uh, it works sort of differently than the Armored Skeptic Patreon. So thank you very much for the patrons listening at home. Tonight's episode is really kind of more about religious perspectives of ghosts and what it means to communicate with ghosts. You know, the, the Christians, at least a good deal of the Christians that I know, have a very one-dimensional perspective of what spirits are on the other side. You know, the Bible says, do not talk to them, they are bad. And I sure as hell know that a lot of them, a lot of people just believe that they're all universally demons, or they're just all universally evil in some way, regardless of what class of being they might be. You know my perspective, of course, I'm a skeptic, so I go into it sort of assuming it's not really real. You know, the left side of my brain says that it's not real. But, you know, the right side of my brain and my heart uh, fully believe that there are other things that I very much have had communication with. And I know lots of other people. I have lots of friends and buddies and acquaintances and... I've interviewed people, and I'm even looking to have somebody on my podcast that talks about it pretty soon. That'd be really fucking cool. I haven't heard an update in that in a little while, though, so I, don't, I probably shouldn't tell you too much. I'll probably have her on at some point, though, to just talk about something that she does. I also know psychics and stuff like that that have a completely different perspective, and they, they sort of interact with ghosts in a very different way than normal ghost hunters do. And I haven't talked about psychic stuff very much. Uh, I don't actually, I don't think I've really talked about it at all, to be honest. But you might be surprised to hear that it's not just something that I'm open to, but it's something that I also am leaning towards belief on. Uh, again, at least the, the right side of my brain is. Because... Again, it's like ghosts. It's one of those I've had enough experiences myself to be like, okay, what the hell is going on? But again, I also know people who either call themselves psychics or have had similar experiences to me where it's just like people just know things they're not supposed to know. B you know, that's the simplest way of putting it, right? But when it comes to the religious perspective of ghosts. I would be dishonest if I didn't say there was a mixed bag of opinions as to what that could be. Because even the very religious and the very Christian and the very Catholic, even people who are within those circles that are taught that there is no such thing as a, a dead person roaming around as a ghost and all spirits are actually something else, when you die, you go somewhere else. You go to heaven. You go to hell. You go to purgatory. or You go to Sheol. 
and uh, those are absolutely broken perspectives of death. I do want to talk about what I personally believe happens when you die, but the thing is, I'm still sort of debating with my friends. Like my, I, I think I mentioned this a lot. My friends know that I have a different perspective of ghosts than them, and that I, I, I have a very non-judgmental skepticism of their perspectives of it. But you know, I, I think that I do have a certain amount of, I don't want to say fear. I'm no baby. <laughs> No, I mean, it's definitely not fear, but um, an apprehension that I think has been trained into me through my Christian upbringing, through the, the, because through that paradigm, you are taught to be afraid of those things. And really, even though I know I've been sort of exploring these concepts for a couple of years now, I've only really just opened myself up to them properly in the last year. Like, my heart is in it now sort of deal, as it were. I think that the idea of dead people roaming around, that is possible. There are other possible explanations for that, though. The, the familiarity that some spirits have with deceased people. The Christians, again, mi mixed bag of opinions, I know. But the one, the one particular viewpoint the dogmatic viewpoint that I want to focus on that comes from the Christian camp is the idea that they're either demons or that there's some sort of shadow creature or like some sort of lower vibrational being that's devoid of personality and sort of through the, the you know, the energy leeching that it's done from the other side and through its interaction and familiarity with you know, your relative or something during their time on the earth. They've sort of, in a way, absorbed their personality in a superficial way. In a, it, they are not literally them. They're not literally your dead relative, but they're sort of like an echo of them that's being portrayed through this somewhat sentient creature, as it were, that is devoid of their own personality. That's a really bizarre possibility. But I, I sort of go into each spirit interaction that I have and each hunt that I have sort of assuming, I guess, that that's what they are. Which is a weird... I know, that's weird. But this is the thing that sort of screws with everyone. So I'm going to get back into ghost hunts again. I know I've only really filmed the one... No, that's not true. Because if you include the Tell Me More episodes, I mean, that was technically a ghost hunt too, even though I did it from my couch. Oh, and side note on that. For some weird reason, you have to go to the playlist of Tell Me More to find episode two, part two, of Ghosts Are Real. It's called Ghosts Are Fake. I don't know what the hell's going on. But YouTube has put something on it that makes it so it doesn't show up properly in some feeds. So you have to hunt for it. I'm actually very upset about that because it's a really good episode. I'll have to put the link to it in the description of this uh, episode. Because it's, even though I would, I would say probably my perspective has changed a little bit since that time. It was a really, really good um, demonstration of sort of the way that I battle with the idea of ghosts in my head, what I think they might be. I think I'm communicating with something, many things even, you know, and I think that, that my friends that think that they are, for the most part, are correct, that there is something and this is not something I can convince you of. In fact, I'm well past the point of even wanting to try to convince anybody that this is true. Like any sort of religious and spiritual experience, it's a personal thing. And ultimately, that's more important. Like, I can share with you that this is what my personal experience is. You can take it or leave it. I don't mind your judgment. It doesn't mean anything to me. But for those of you who are going through similar things, 
you know, it's really cool that we can bounce these personal perspectives off of each other. I really like the metaphor of the blind men and the elephant. I I feel like I said it in the last episode, so I'm not going to repeat it this time. But I am taking the idea that there are dead people more seriously. So what, what I was going to say is even though I go into each hunt sort of just as, like my my baseline assumption is that they are spirits, there is something there, but they're not really what they're saying they are. Like, they ha they would have to convince me that they are literally who they say they are. Now, as for psychics, they seem way more convinced, like ridiculously convinced of the personality that they're speaking to, how they manifest, how they um, represent themselves. And I often hear the phrase that what you die in is what you wear in the spirit world. And like lots of ghost hunters have repeated that. And I mean, maybe that is real. Maybe that's true. But maybe these psychics are just picking up a psychic projection of what these things want to be seen as. What they, a, a personality that they've adopted, that they pulled off the rack because they liked it a lot. But one thing I will say, though is that spirits definitely feel a sense of ownership over the spaces that they haunt. And you can imagine, whatever these are, these spirits, these personalities, like they think that this house is theirs because, they've, they, again, it's something that they've adopted. That much, that much you have to concede that spirits choose to be attached to specific places or things. And... In that way, they sort of choose their personality, what is defining them. And a lot of them will choose a home, a house. Like, that's probably the favorite. But there almost always seems to be a total mix of personalities there. Maybe from different eras, or maybe they're coming in from different places, or whatever. But they also all seem to interact with each other, have relationships with each other. They'll say, like, oh, like one of them will be sort of a childish spirit and say that they really hate the old man, they're mean, and then the old man spirit, you know, will be like really bossy and strict. And it's interesting how those sorts of dynamics come out in ghost investigations. When I go into a ghost hunt, God, it's taken me forever to get to this point. When I go into a ghost hunt, even though I go in with that baseline assumption that they're not what they say what they are, I behave with full 100% sincerity towards these things. I treat the property like it's there, they own it. You know, I'm, I'm respectful of the things. I don't just barge in and act like I own the place, like I'm gonna take control of some hunt and show everybody that ghosts are real. Like I, I behave as if I'm a guest and I let them sort of dictate the experience to me. And when I'm talking to them, as if they're speaking the truth. I don't, I don't challenge them and stuff. Like, I, I don't shut them down. In that way, I feel like I'm exactly like any other uh, ghost hunter or ghost investigator. Because, you know, I like to make fun of Zach Baggins a lot. <laughs> His show is kind of cheesy and stuff too. But to be honest, uh, I've marathoned his... <laughs> I've marathoned the episodes of his show so many times I've lost count. You know, I've watched all those ghost hunting shows. I love that shit. And I was convinced one day I'd grow up to become that. And you know what's kind of funny? is It sort of feels like that is naturally going to end up being the next stage of my life. Not literally becoming a ghost hunter, but traveling around and doing this sort of thing that I'm doing on the podcast and on the Armored Skeptic channel, but more of like a hands-on, investigative even sort of approach. Seeing these places in person, getting my own footage, it's gonna be sweet. Uh, I really, okay, so I really like going into these ghost hunts with sincerity, and you'll, you'll notice that one thing that really bothers me is when I take other people on ghost hunts, and you, you'll probably see me at my worst. <laughs> <laughs> I probably don't get more angry at people than I do when they start fucking around on a ghost hunt. Because you already sort of feel silly doing it, right? And then when somebody stop, stops taking it seriously and 
like yeah i mean part of part of that feeling that i feel i'm sure is a little bit of conviction about how silly i feel doing it but the other thing is that they're literally disrespecting the personalities that you're trying to communicate with that you're trying to establish a relationship with probably catch me like yelling at somebody that's doing that especially if i'm in the middle of trying to talk to them I think that that's probably not even the worst thing to do because then the spirit at least sees that you're defending them and and whatever. But I've literally had these really good conversations going and then somebody joked around and whatever and then it just totally shut the conversation down because they didn't appreciate, clearly didn't appreciate being made fun of. That's just, that's sort of the sense you get, you know. That could also just be your pareidolia shutting off because, again, that's... That same conviction of feeling silly for doing it, all of a sudden you're, you're just not in the zone anymore, so you don't think you're hearing the shit anymore. Maybe that's what it is. You know, that's what the skeptical side of me would say. God, I love arguing with myself. This is the best show on the internet, ladies and gentlemen. I don't talk about this very much. I kind of feel like it's sort of just about time to tell the story, though. Like, there's no reason not to. But you sort of, you have to forgive me if I have a little bit of trouble getting the story out here. So, I used to be a singer. I, I'm a little bit of a musician, okay? I can play guitar and piano pretty well. I've actually taken lessons and learned how to play at least 10 different instruments just a little bit. But I definitely gravitated towards piano and guitar. I'm not saying I'm a good, I'm not a good musician. I would... And any, anybody could kick my ass in any kind of music competition. <laughs> just, this is just what, what I like. Anyways, but I was. I have no problem bragging that I was an excellent singer. I was like a 9 out of 10 when uh, I was a kid, even going into my teens, I remember. Now... I stopped singing before my voice dropped, like really like, you know what I mean. Cables cut on the elevator drop, radio voice drop. And I really like my radio voice, don't get me wrong. I really appreciate this gift that I was given. But I'm, I'm only just starting to get back into singing and I haven't figured out how to use this as a singing voice because it is a little bit different than when I was younger. I'm, I'm obviously going to need to get some sort of a, a vocal coach to help me out here. I got a couple things that I'm going to sing, though. I'll probably upload, maybe. I don't know. We'll see. But what sort of got me out of it? <laughs> it's actually sort of... The reason I'm bringing it up is because it, it's, it is part of my own spiritual experience here that I'm talking about. But I also want to sort of tie this into why I'm bringing up Satanism. So this, is, this episode is sort of picking up from the last episode, right? So this is part of my own spiritual journey. And I'm, I'm t- I want to talk about, I'm, like, I want to tie in why I'm bringing up my problem with Satanism in these last two podcasts. Because, again, I remind you, whenever Satanism comes up and people are like, oh, Satanists are terrible, the news always carts out Anton Levayian Satanists. His, I think his son was uh, the leader for a little while. I, I, don't, I can't remember the name of the guy that's the leader now. These guys are harmless. You know, the Anton LaVey, Church of Satan, whatever the hell you want to call it. They use the Satanic Bible. For the most part, those guys are harmless, and I would even say most of them are decent and or good people. But those are not the Satanists that most people are complaining about when they complain about how evil Satanists are. But when you really get down to it, it's just another religion. A cult, yes. A bad cult, even. But I would argue that it is widespread enough and big enough that it is a religion like any other religion, even an organized one. And again, I'm not talking about the Anton LaVey shit. I'm talking about the they're doing illegal shit, people. And this is this going into this is a lot darker. I try to keep these episodes lighthearted and fun. And uh, I struggled really hard figuring out an appropriate way to present this episode to you, um, because it is a lot darker. 
I I wouldn't blame some of you guys if you walk away from this episode feeling a little bit depressed about some of the things you might hear. So this is your warning. I did sort of touch on it a little bit in the last episode, just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about, but I'm I'm going to give you darker examples now. But I feel it's appropriate to sort of uh, show you one of my own wounds, as it were, because religion is evil. Whether it has horns or a halo, it's evil. Once it gets to the point of organization, it always inherently becomes evil. So when I was in, oh god, grade one, so we're going way back, toddler man, young prodigy, wow, so they would have you believe, sorry, I'm trying to, I'm trying to make light of something that was kind of terrible that happened to me, so anyways, this guy, (laughs) the, the, the music teacher for my school at the time, he, he would get, um, I think about a half an hour or an hour. I don't know. I don't remember. I don't, I don't recall time periods from that far back. Again, it was like grade one. But he would have us for like an, 45 minutes maybe, a couple times a week. We'd be singing in music class. I don't remember much about it. He just, I remember he looked kind of like he had a scraggly beard, really scraggly hair. Um, bald on the top, white hair, of course. Looked like a a junky Santa Claus. And I remember even thinking that as a kid, that he looked sort of like a little too disheveled. But, you know, you just accept reality for what it is when you're in grade one and you just press on and trust all the adults around you. The way my parents describe it, he was extremely interested in having me join his choir. He was the choir master for the St. George's Anglican Cathedral. And this was a big deal because at the time they were world renowned. They were singing all around Canada, all around the world. Um, I, I don't, I don't want to say what their achievements were, but I, I just remember being given the impression that they were award winning on an international level. And, uh, as I was growing up, you know, I was getting more and more confident in my singing skills. Definitely thought I was going to be a singer. My parents definitely thought so. It seemed, but he was very, very interested in having me join. Obviously... In hindsight, you know, I look back and (laughs) I wonder how my parents couldn't have seen that that was a giant red flag. But, you know, I guess different times. And also he really was literally like one of the more famous people in Kingston (laughs) at the time, you know, especially if you're into into vocals. Yeah, as I got older, I got more interested in singing. I actually was in uh, the youth choir group for my church, which was a different church. And I was regularly taking big roles in musicals, stuff like that. I never did anything in the big theater, like an official municipal play, as it were. But I definitely was part of almost every school play. I even played... uh, Joseph from the uh, <laughs> Technicolor Dreamcoat. Well, that was actually just a sketch in an Andrew Lloyd Webber compilation play that we that we did. But that was kind of fun. That was probably the highest pitched song I ever had to sing. <laughs> so anyways, eventually, I had I can't remember how much older I was. I definitely was much older though. Many years had passed. I'd Definitely improved my chops, as it were, my singing chops. And uh, they had me audition for the St. George's Choir. And I remember going in there and just absolutely fucking slaying in that audition. God, I was so fucking good. 
I walked out of there very proud of myself. My mother drove me home. She seemed proud of me. It was a good moment for me. And then it wasn't that long after my mother informed me that I had been accepted. And for the very first time in my entire singing career, I was given the choice. So every, everything that I had done vocally up to this point, <laughs> my entire singing career was under the beaten drum of my parents, like just signing me up for stuff, setting me up to do things. We'll, we'll say encouraging me to become more involved in school stuff. That's probably the best way to put it. But today was the day that I got to choose for the first time. My mother looked me in the eye and said, do you want to join? And I was like, wait, I get to choose? Uh, no, I don't want to join. And that was that, it never came up again. And that was maybe a little miracle. I continued singing in my local church choir for a little while longer. I definitely did that until I was maybe 13. And then in high school, I was part of like a, we were a parody band. <laughs> but I also did perform a few sort of uh, special acts here and there with other friends of mine that were more serious musical acts. I, I was pretty proud of some of the singing I did then. I think, I think maybe 17, no, I'll say 18. That might have been my peak, my vocal peak. But before that, I can't remember exactly when, but it was when I was a teenager. Uh, the news came out that, yes, I dodged an enormous fucking bullet that... The choir master of the St. George's Cathedral had been doing very bad things to the boys in the choir, uh, taking them out on these, like, special group adventures, as it were. And I was obviously very, very, very lucky <laughs> that, you know, I was almost fed to a wolf, right? But I know people that were. This fucked me up a little bit when it comes to singing. You know, I sort of just, like... I lost my passion for it, but this was also one of the bigger daggers that stuck in my back that <laughs> through my religious experience that this was the first real catalyst, we'll say, to my spiritual journey. That's a fun way to put it. And the thing is that this is not unique. We all know that the church system has this sort of thing floating around in it and has had it for a very, very, very long time. This is an evil that has existed in the church for a very long time. And though there is obviously an enormous element of people in the church that want to end it and stop it, um, it still happens. It's not like a huge difference to jump from that to Satanism. Uh, uh, the, the Satanism I'm talking about. Remember how I mentioned during the Satanic Panic, some genuinely shocking, scary shit came out. Well, I'm going to play a little bit from an Oprah Winfrey interview here. So, this particular interview I'm a little bit skeptical of. I'm not entirely sure if this is being represented properly to us. But this woman claims to have come from a satanic ritual abuse family. And whether or not she is literally telling the truth, she is at very least conveying a thing that I think that we have reason to believe is, is very real. This culture of satanic families, religious uh, abusers of their own families, and uh, there are multiple examples of survivors that have come out of these things. Uh, the next one is 100% real, but I just wanted to start with this one because this was one of the introductions to it that the mainstream public got. So the, sort of the thing I want to get across is just how weird the satanic panic made the communication of this sort of concept. I talked about John Todd last time, and I'm not convinced he was telling the truth though he was skirting around something very much like the Dulce Bass thing and Phil Schneider. I feel like he's almost this sort of outsider that knew enough about the thing to sort of facsimilate 
the personality of someone that actually lived through it and use that for their own cloud. Now, if, you know, John Todd did that. He was uh, absolutely taking the Lord's name in vain. Oh, my fucking God. <laughs> naughty, naughty boy. And I think that this woman might be an example of that. I don't know. She might be telling the truth. So I, I don't want to, like, belittle her experience if she is. But this was one of the first introductions that the mainstream public got in the United States. That's sort of the, uh, the focal point here. So the, 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 the United States first introduction. You come from generations of ritualistic uh, abuse? Um, yes, my family has an extensive family tree, and they keep track of who's been involved and who hasn't been involved. And it's gone back to, like, 1700. And so you were... Right. Maybe. I was born into a family that believes in this. And, and this is a, this is, does everyone else think it's a nice Jewish family? From the outside, you appear to be a nice Jewish girl. Definitely. And you all are worshipping the devil inside the home? Right. There is other Jewish families across the country, not just my own family. Really? And so who knows about it? Lots of people now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I talked to a police detective in the Chicago area, and several of my friends know, and I've spoke publicly before. And So when you were brought up in this, this kind of evilness, did you just think it was normal? Um, I've blocked out a lot of the memories I had um, because of my multiple personality disorder. But yes, I mean, it's like if you grow up with something, you think it's normal. Mm -hmm. I always thought... So what kinds of things? You don't have to give us the gory details, but what kinds of things went on in the family? Um, well, there would be rituals in which babies would be sacrificed and you would have to, you know... Who's babies? Um, there were people who um, bred babies in their family. No one would know about it. A lot of people were overweight, so you couldn't tell if they were pregnant or not. Or they would supposedly go away for a while and then come back. The other thing I want to point out, not all Jewish people sacrifice babies. I mean, no, no. it's not a very we kind of thing. <laughs> I just want to point that out. <laughs> so I encourage you to look that up. This particular interview brought up that there is a specific Abrahamic belief system attached to this satanic ritual abuse. But there are Christian-based ones as well. It's not exclusively a Jewish thing. Not even close. And one of the things that people brought up as like a skeptical argument against this woman's testimony was how lighthearted and unaffected she was while giving her testimony. And I think maybe that's one of the reasons why I'm still sort of stuck on it. However, people have used that same argument for the next interview I'm going to bring up. And I'm going to tell you why I believe that this next interview is being 100% honest. Like I said in the last episode, <laughs> like I said in the last episode, the satanic panic was really silly. There was a lot of dumb stuff that came out of it. And I'm going to finish this segment with that to sort of tie back into the whole spirit communication portion of this podcast episode. The point I'm going to eventually sort of get to, and I might as well make it now so I don't forget to later, is that all of that silly stuff that all of these Christian groups were producing to jump on what we would call today an algorithmic trend, the, the popularity of a subject, they were, a lot of Christian groups were piggybacking on that, creating propaganda to convince people to become Christians. And that's funny and fun, and I like making fun of that. But I don't want to start with that because it's going to make... Obviously, this part that I'm talking about right now, the tonal shift. Like I said, it's, it's kind of an awkward episode because of how dark this gets. But the last woman talked about baby sacrifice. I don't know if she mentioned animal sacrifice, but whether or not she was telling the truth, she was talking about something that I think was very real. But, okay, the good thing about the satanic panic was that that same algorithmic trend the Christians were piggybacking on and sort of creating and, and perpetuating, which is really what gave most life to it. Real stories of actual satanic abuse and satanic cults and victims of Satanism came out, were brought into the limelight. But this one did make it into the mainstream. And this is what makes this one unique. 
is it's the only one that I believe at least that made it into the mainstream and of all places it was Australia that brought this story to light God bless Australia 60 Minutes Australia did an interview piece on an Australian sect of one of these small family based cultures of Satanism now like I said each satanic group is broken down into their family groups but they are a community which is what makes them a cult or a religion friends of family and strangers and my family used to rape me um make me uh, abort the babies I had it would be hard to imagine more misery and suffering than what Teresa says she's had to endure. And us kids would be made to do things with the adults and the animals. And then a, a sacrifice would happen. The sacrifice? Uh, were these animal sacrifices? Animals and um, people. On what scale do you think this was happening? Enormous. Far beyond what we've ever heard of here before. Teresa's mother, Bridget. You're talking about mass murder? Yes, on a scale that this country's never heard of before. Like the old people's homes now. I mean, these are... For the first time, Teresa is learning what it's like to live with love instead of fear. Pretty love. In this quiet English village, with the help of her mother, she's slowly repairing her broken life. Teresa is now 15. Yes, yeah, so like I said, really dark. I'm so sorry. I did warn you. Now, of course, I'm not trying to compare my experience to this. That's not why I brought my experience up. But I've heard many other testimonies like this from many other younger uh, boys and girls who were rescued from these situations who described equally terrifying scenarios bizarre rituals, being buried alive, things that would cause a level of terror in you that would forever irreparably change you. And it's such a fucking insult that these Christian propaganda groups were piggybacking their propaganda off of this. This was real. So what, what I was alluding to before, with this case, the case before, and the, the case that I am not going to mention, one of the skeptical arguments people bring up in all three is that the person in the interview seems relatively emotionally unaffected by what they're talking about. But what one thing that people are not factoring in, and, I, I, you know, understandably so, because... This is a hard thing to understand about the human psyche. Those of us who have not been through that abuse, if we walk into that for one second and then have to describe it, we would be in tears. Like, we'd, we'd be broken. And that's sort of what people expect to see when they see these people describe these things happening to them in these interviews. But that's not reality. Because these people were raised in these environments. These people have been through such a level of trauma. They're so broken that they don't even have a proper set of emotions tied to traumatic events like that. They're survivors. That particular girl that was on uh, 60 Minutes Australia, Teresa, she was being interviewed right at the beginning of her rehabilitation process. She was just very matter-of-fact talking about killing babies. It's terrifying to think that you could be that emotionally unaffected by doing something like that. But imagine years of being in an environment like that. And abusing the children is part of the ritual because of the way that it affects them mentally. They know that it does that, and they do that to each generation intentionally so that they're all broken the same way. That's the religion. What the fuck? And there's not a lot of people that talk about this kind of thing because, you know, maybe rightfully so, YouTube takes down <laughs> 
every video that talks about this kind of stuff. It's very heavily censored. So the fact that we have this 60 Minutes Australia checked marked account video with nearly 3 million views up showing that this is real. You know, that's why I said God bless Australia. Because otherwise we might not have reliable mainstream exposure of this. Oprah doesn't count. I'm sorry. <laughs> It just It's just the medium of it being on Oprah. It leaves too much up for question. To end on something a little bit more lighthearted, though, and to sort of express my disdain against organized Christianity once again. So this video that I brought up is called The Testimony from an Ex-Satanist, What Satan Does Not Want You to Know. I almost couldn't find this. This used to be a really easy video to find. It was called A Million Things. I thought it was deleted. I literally found it 15 minutes before the podcast was supposed to start. That's why I started half an hour later than normal tonight, because I started putting together something a little slightly different. So uh, that might also be why I seem a little disorganized. Though, come on. We all know that's an excuse. I admit every single episode that I'm not even remotely organized. These are those Christian haircut Obvious from a million miles away, these guys are fucking Christian people I was talking about. <laughs> when these guys knock on your door, you fucking know they're going to ask you about Jesus. They found, I called him a French Canadian. And I'm sticking to that just because I like the aesthetic of it. But to be honest, I'm not entirely sure. The man's name is Roger Morneau. So it's a, it is a French name. Part of the dishonesty of this, I want to point at the interviewers because they're not doing their due diligence, even if they are being honest, that they, they genuinely believe that this sort of thing is real, that they're trying their best to believe this guy, and they're not trying to be skeptical of him at all. So at very least, yes, they're being dishonest in that way. But I also think that they might also just know that this guy is not telling the truth if he's not telling the truth and they're playing along because it works towards their pro-christian propaganda sort of thing you remember that uh, i love that I, I love bringing up art bell and coast to coast because i like to pretend that i'm a spiritual successor of that show obviously on a on a very minimal way <laughs> one of the tricks that christians would play on that show is they'd call in to give their testimony very much like you guys do at the end of my show. People would have these very rigidly practiced stories that would always end with, I prayed to Jesus and everything got better. And that was an obvious Christian ploy to convert people to Christianity. So fucking obvious. And Art Bell, like, would clearly have very little patience for these people. He'd let them finish, but he'd yell at them. I have an example of that in my Art Bell episode on the Armored Skeptic channel, if, if you want to see for yourself. I just absolutely love how angry he would get at these people. But again, he'd, he'd, he'd play along enough that they would get to finish their little tale. So I'm going to let you listen to, like, a little snippet of this. I might jump in to give some commentary from time to time, but... I don't know. I also have a bong in front of me, so no promises. How in the world did you ever get involved in praying to demon spirits? When I came out of the uh, Navy after World War II, I um, was looking for to take up a trade in Montreal, Canada. And at that time, I ran across uh, a fellow that, that had been on a particular ship with me and he said, hey, Mono, you're alive. How nice to meet you. He says, let's have a dinner tonight. I said to my boss, can I have the evening off? So I got the evening off, and I went out. Uh, we went out and had dinner. He told me, hey, I got something fantastic to tell you. He said, I am affiliated with people that speak with the spirits of the dead. How would you like to talk to this, the, the spirit of your dead mother? And I was shocked. <laughs> I was shocked. He said, you wouldn't be uh, afraid of talking to, to the spirit of your dead mother, would you? Well, I said, I'll tell you what, I would have to give that some thought, because it's something I never thought about before in my life. I said, when do we 
Pour de Science. So one Saturday evening, we were in the place. <clears throat> it was the very first time. Very beautiful place. A medium it was a lady. She had a gorgeous new home in Montreal. And there were about 20 uh, invited guests there. She communicated with the spirits for uh, different people there. And you're telling them what the spirit said. And then there was one lady that had been talking almost continually before the, the seance started. And she didn't believe in the, the, you know, the dead appearing and all of this and all that. And she said, well, I would have to see my dead sister. She says, to believe it. So <laughs> while this, uh, the seance was, was going, one man uh, <clears throat> said, I would like to talk to my friend that died six months ago. But I don't want him to appear. Just want to talk to him. Because he says, I don't trust you talking to my, my friend for me. So the uh, medium says, let me inquire of the spirit. Yeah, the spirit will, will talk with you. And that big masculine voice was heard in the place. It says, hi, Frank. It's nice of you to ask for me to talk with you. And they had a little chat. And after it was over, Frank says, this is the greatest thing honored to be able to talk with the spirits of the dead. Then, this, the medium said, we have a very special surprise tonight. A spirit will manifest itself openly. And it's, right, it's like a big gust of wind hit the building and right through the wall. Now, the, the lights weren't uh, terribly bright, but they, you know, they were like living room lights. And that uh, translucent being seemed to come right out of the wall. How did you feel right at that moment? It's almost like my heart stopped a little bit, you know, very weird feeling. So it was a lady in a beautiful evening gown, swirling. And she said to, to Mary, my dear sister, you are so wonderful to have asked for me. And Mary fainted and fell right off her chair on the floor. <laughs> and a couple of guys jumped up and picked her up and uh, it's very gone. And that was the beginning of it. There's something interesting about the, the human uh, mind. You can adjust an awful lot of stuff. You can adjust to a lot of things that, you, that would terrify you to begin with. After a while, they become common and ordinary. I then I got into a secret society that worshipped the spirits, you see. That well, how did, okay, now, how, how is that different from the seance, Roger? The seance are not involving in many ways. But when you get into a secret society of spirit worshippers, then and especially when you're invited there by the direction of the higher-ups in the spirit world. You never get out of there alive. And it's exactly what my friend and I were up against. We didn't know anything about it. And uh, there was a very, very popular big band leader. A jazz jazz, jazz musician. band. Yeah. One night we went to one of these uh, seances and uh, he was with his wife. Now the spirits had told him what to do. The spirit told him. There's two of these guys, give the names. We'll make it so that your wife will want to talk to the, to the medium when you say that you want to go home because you're tired. So, Roger, you're at this restaurant. What happened? The band leader and came and said, good evening, and uh, you gentlemen want a table. So you're one of the reserved people. As we talk, the band leader says, how long have you fellas been involved with sorcery? <laughs> and he chalked us a little bit. And I said, exactly what do you mean? What you people are doing, talking to the supposed spirits of the dead. He says, this is, this is, this is silly. And this man had been at the seance with you. Yeah, oh yeah. And he's telling you that it's silly what you've yeah. just done. Because see, my wife, he says, goes to the seances because she gets comfort and she gets uh, something good out of it, good feeling out of it. And she lives for what the spirits are, you know, are gonna see that the future is gonna be like. To me, he says, I can't bother with this stuff. He says, I want power. I go right to the source of power. And he says, how do you think that I became famous the way that I am? And I said, you must have had some good luck. Or he says, there's no such thing as good luck. He says, there's either some power working for you somewhere, or you don't get ahead in this world. Not in my, my type of occupation. It went from there that we went, to, we got talking about uh, spirit worship. The supposed spirits of the dead that you're talking with are demon spirits. They're fallen angels. They're beautiful beings. Just set it out, just like oh, that. Oh, yeah. It didn't make you uneasy when he said they were Well, you know, it shocked you a little bit, you know. 
He said, uh, you guys have got a great future ahead of you. Because we've been told, the high priest of our society, secret society, has been told that the master has very special plans for you too. Now, what did he mean by the master? Uh, Satan. I know, I'm sorry that was so dry. He's a very old French-Canadian man. <laughs> Any English-Canadian will tell you the French are damn near insufferable. <laughs> no, I'm teasing, of course. She's just got that old man ramble going. But those were all the points I wanted to get across. He goes on to describe how these sessions go, that people will show up to these supposed spirit uh, communication places. They'll uh, sit down on these couches and these big elaborate rooms, and then they'll hear voices th being thrown at them through the walls in different directions of dead loved ones. And supposedly these voices are perfectly accurate and they're perfectly uh, representing the personality and the knowledge set of these dead loved ones, at least well enough that the people attending these events believe that that's what's happening. Now, there's no question as to why the Christian propaganda group would want to eat this story up. God damn, it's delicious to them. It basically confirms that dogmatic belief that all spirits are one thing, demons, evil, untrustworthy. Now, this guy goes a step further as to say they're fallen angels, which... Ooh, I'd love to explore that idea. Technically, according to Enoch, that's what demons are. But... Is this guy telling the truth? I simply want to call bullshit. I really don't like this guy. I don't like his story. I don't like how rigid he is to telling it. How every single time, oh, I wish I could show you his face. How he clearly is going into performer mode every time he's asked a question. He doesn't quite answer the question exactly how it's asked. He just picks the thing from his library of talking points that most closely fits the thing that was just asked of him. And then he rambles like an old man about it. Oh, yes, I, yeah. He, uh, to give him credit, he's not waving his hands around like a normal French Canadian usually does when they talk. Sorry, that's the last time I'm going to roast French Canadians. I love French Canadians. He says that he's from Montreal, and I really like Montreal. But uh, Quebec City is one of the most beautiful places in all of Canada. Anyways, his story very much basically fits a lot of these sort of stories you would hear coming out of Christian groups. Now, this guy in particular, he sort of fits the bill of these kinds of characters like John Todd. I hope I'm saying that name right. God, I, you know who I'm talking about. The guy that I last time. Very much this, like, traveling storyteller that would go around to these different events and give his testimony of his time in these satanic groups. And you hear, like, how excited they get when he's like, how long were you into sorcery? <laughs> I know the Christians like Christians are like foaming at the mouth. It's like, yeah, yeah, sorcery is evil. Yeah, Satanists do sorcery. Oh my god, I love it. Just fucking hilarious. And I obviously, like I said, I have no respect for these traveling storytellers. The I love again the example of this guy going around telling a dream he had of what the end times are going to be like. This beautiful man on these big screens telling everybody what to do. Forcing everyone to get the mark of the beast. Hilarious. Love these guys. There was a time, I will admit, that I was pretty rigidly set on the idea that all spirits were bad. And not only am I now more open-minded to the concept of them being other things, but... I'm even way more open-minded to the concept of them being literally dead people, or at least some of them. This is a really good example, I think, of why I'm, I'm able to let go of my older mindsets. Because I'm looking back at this old propaganda shit that I used to love when I was younger. I don't think I ever really particularly loved this example. I just think that this is the, the perfect example. But I don't think I ever believed this guy. <laughs> but 
it it does sort of remind me of the time that I that I would find the odd video like this that I would I don't know necessarily believe, but it would at least sway me enough to convince me that my fear was justified. But I think that there is more. Anyways, I'm gonna take a quick break. And my voice is doing well. Ooh, I'm gonna be able to seduce you all the way through the second half of this episode, I think. So I've got four or five really nice little stories for you. Uh, thank you again. Remember, email your stories to fullmetaltuxedo at gmail.com. Uh, Peter Watkins, thank you for the super chat. DM'd ya, buddy. No worries, just offering some knowledge if you want. Otherwise, feel free to ignore me. Oh, I'll definitely read the DM. Thanks, bud. Tevis. Ooh, thank you for the super chat, Tevis. Gonna spend some family time, so I'll catch the stream a bit later tonight. I did want to ask you here instead of on Discord. What are the feelings on Buddhist beliefs? I find them fascinating as a story at the very least. To oversimplify, Buddhism was one particular sect, very much like Christianity sort of grew off of the Hebrew belief system, the way we sort of understand it. Buddhism very much grew off of the Hindu belief system in a very similar way. I know I'm going to get like a bunch of people flaming me for saying that, but trust me, that's essentially how it works. There's a lot about Buddhism I don't like. There's sort of like being one with the purpose of and you know the function of the universe thing sounds great in a lot of ways i really like you know they're essentially like vegan approach i'm not a vegan i eat meat but i like that they love animals that much that they're they live they live with animals they don't eat them they're also believers in reincarnation i am as well so there's a lot that i really like about them and a lot of that is some of the better aspects of the Hindu belief system as well. You know, I'll, I'll lump them together in that way and say that they, they both share aspects that I really rather admire. But I mean, I'm not accusing Buddhists of this, though there are Buddhists like this. Allegedly. <laughs> for legal purposes but if you at least you could argue that if you take their um philosophy of accepting fate and being one with the purpose of reality as it were you could argue that buddhists believe that people that are born disfigured or deformed or disabled that that's because karma is punishing them for something that they did in a past life and this sort of belief system leads some Buddhists to step over people that are suffering because they think that they earn that fate. And that's fucking gross. But other than that, one thing Buddhists are pretty great. And they've got a similar concept to the Messiah. They think, uh, like, Buddha is a reincarnated being. There's different versions of him. That fat version of him laughing, either that's not really a Buddha or that's not, the, that's not the one that most people literally refer to. Like if Jesus in the same way, like I argue that he was, he's, his death and rebirth being born into a new body exactly the way the Bible describes it and the way he describes it is reincarnation as well. That essentially if Buddha and Jesus are not the same people, that they're like parallels in that way. At least in the, you know, they're in the belief system. Yeah, that's a really good question. So thank you. Thank you very much for that question. But they, um, yeah, they think that the final Buddha, you've probably heard of the Matreyu, this character Christians believe is going to be the Antichrist because he's going to unite the religions. How evil. Okay. God, I just, I love how overly paranoid and wrong the Christians are about everything. Okay, and oh my god, I am not even going to try to pronounce that name. E.E. -E. <laughs> Thank you very much for the super chat. I says, this was not your fault, Gregory. I hope one day you can sing again. You're safe now and nobody can lead you to that danger ever again. Oh, I really appreciate that sentiment. I, I assure you guys that um, I'm over that. 
And like I said, I wasn't literally a victim. It, it did fuck me up a little bit, but I'm, I'm good now. I tell you that I, if I share stories like this with you guys, they're not the stories I would tell my friends about things that I'm still upset about or struggling with. I tell you these stories, I share these stories so you guys can understand me better. That being said, for people out there that are suffering in a similar way, this sentiment is absolutely beautiful. So thank you for sharing this with us. In the shadows, aren't you friends? And the ghosts, and they'll pretend. When we're lost in the world that don't belong to us. We'll try and make a sense in things that are dark, and we'll wonder why we don't speak. Time for your stories. So this is the hardest part of the show because it is the part that I challenge my dyslexia, but I'm also reading very tiny text. <laughs> also, the sun's in my eyes, the wind is blowing in the wrong direction, you know, my shoe's got a hole in it, uh, I overslept, or I didn't get enough sleep, my underwear's on backwards. God, just the most frustrating. I, well, actually, one complaint I can make is that I forgot to turn on my air conditioner during the break. So it is, uh, the heat came back and I am suffering. <laughs> so I'm recording in my skivvies right now. Okay, so the first story is from Adam. Hello, Gregory, you can call me Adam. I've been enjoying your content for a few years since your atheist days. Ooh, I love that people bring that up. Like it's a, a, a past tense thing. <laughs> no, I know what you mean. I literally mean atheist content. I'm enjoying your new stuff and uh, you've been pulling, you've been putting out, so it's right up my alley. Well, great to hear. Um, now he wrote a little bit more, but he sent me a, a document. So I'm just gonna read the document here because it seems very interesting. First, a description of my bed. My bed at the time was the bottom of a bunk bed with the top bed removed. I think I had that sleeping arrangement at one point too. So it had a footboard that was like a ladder. I was tall enough so that my feet could reach the footboard. Lastly, I sleep with a blanket over my eyes to keep out light. All right, not to keep out the boogeyman. It's not, it has nothing to do with the fact that you're afraid of the dark. It's to keep out light exclusively. All right, all right, I'll take your word for it. <laughs> I'm just teasing. Uh, one morning I woke up. When I was fully awake, I noticed that I had, I haven't moved at all yet. I could move if I wanted, I just hadn't yet. I decided to stay still and pretend to still be asleep. I didn't need to get up anyway. I don't remember how much time passed from when I woke up, but it must have been a minute or less. I started to hear a tapping coming from the end of my bed. The sound of wood being hit. One tap per second. Ooh, that's ominous. Ooh, I could feel the vibration of each tap with my feet. Still not moving, I began to think of what to do. I couldn't see because of the blanket over my head. Hmm. Couldn't see the spooky man because you had a blanket over your face. All right, this is not helping. <laughs> this is not helping dispel my theory that you're scared of spooky people. <laughs> do I try to quickly whip the blanket off my head? Do I move even just my toes to see if it stops? Do I keep still to see how long it lasts? The tapping continued as I thought. It probably wasn't any more than a minute when I made a decision. I decided to try to see what was making the noise. As quick as I could, I whipped the blanket off my face. 
But as soon as I moved, the tapping stopped. There was nothing that I saw that could have been making the tapping. It made me think if this tapping had ever woken me up before. The only difference being that I moved when I woke up. So it stopped immediately. I got a new bed, bigger and without a footboard. My feet still nearly hanging off the end. Oh, I'm in that same camp, brother. <laughs> Even in my queen bed, my feet hang off the end. Uh, when I got it, I thought to myself, now that my bed doesn't have a footboard, if that tapping happens again, what will it tap on? Ooh, now that's an ominous thought. One night I woke up, my feet almost off the end of my bed, with the blanket hanging down loose. I could swear I could feel the blanket swaying. I don't sleep with the blanket loosely hanging off my feet anymore. Now I tuck the blanket under my feet. Now this part isn't very convicting to me. It could have been my fan, me just moving a bit, or most likely just me imagining it. This last Memorial Day, 2021, I woke up at about 6 a.m., a slight panic, because it was Monday. Then, annoyance, because I woke up so early on a day I didn't work. I put the blanket back over my eyes to go back to sleep. Suddenly, on my goddamned head, rapid tapping. Oh my fucking god. I sprang up and panicked and looked around to see nothing that could have done it. Plus, I had just looked around my room before putting the blanket back over my eyes. I didn't see anything then. Oh my god, that's fucking terrifying. I've heard stories of people being woken up by a voice yelling at them to wake up. But I guess whatever I got was a bit more hands-on. I hope this doesn't happen again, but I'll let you know if it does. Oh my god, great story. Amazing story. Thank you so much, Adam. I appreciate it. I've been woken up once by hearing my name screamed. I'm not going to repeat that story. <laughs> Thank you very much, Tara, for your stories. I think this is two stories. It looks like it's been broken up. Hello. Hello, Tara. I have two strange stories from when I was younger. The bed. Oh my god, two bed stories in a row. What is this, the bed podcast? This happened when I was about five years old. I had very regular sleepwalking and nightmare episodes. I had a profound fear of falling asleep at night and in the dark, but I don't know where this fear came from. I had this extremely odd ritual and felt if I was not looking at and facing the doorway that something was going to come through my door. Oh, that's interesting. Gotta always constantly looking at the door to ensure that nothing ever comes through it. What an interesting fear. I used to fall asleep with the door cracked open to have some light from the hallway. I would fall asleep staring at the doorway. I love the contrast between the two sleeping styles of the, these two stories here. One person always constantly looking at something and another person always covered up. Interesting. I had a brass bed that used to be my great grandmother's. The bed was heavy and had a brass headboard and footboard. It was old and was a little wobbly. I woke up in the middle of the night. My vision was still fuzzy and I remember feeling very weak. I suddenly realized why I had been woken up. My bed was shaking and moving back and forth with a lot of force. Oh my god. That's terrifying. I got a rush of adrenaline and looked at the end of my bed. The brass bar footboard was moving back and forth quickly and violently, as if someone had taken hold of the bed and was trying to break it off. There was no one there. 
I just started screaming hysterically. I could not move my body. My parents shot out of bed and ran to my room. My naked mother launched on top of me and held me down. The shaking stopped shortly after. Just kept screaming and took a while for them to calm me down. Oh my god. You know, I have to say that that vivid detail of, of a nude family member jumping on top of you, I gotta say that gives this story some credibility. Because <laughs> I would not otherwise want to admit such a detail. My parents told me that it was the dog. That the dog was scratching her ear and hitting my bed with her leg. Oh my god, I would be so dissatisfied with that explanation. When I, when I got, I'm sorry, I'm laughing. I know that this is scary. This is scary. When I got older, my parents confused. <laughs> when I got older, my par parents confessed that the dog was not in my room and that they were just trying to calm me down. Yeah, no kidding. I didn't believe them anyways. My dog wouldn't have kept scratching like that if I was screaming and crying. It also went on for what felt like one to two minutes. That would feel like an eternity for something like that, especially if you're just waking up into it. It's like your whole reality for two minutes. I never had anything like this happen to me again. I did, however, refuse to sleep in that bed and we got rid of it after my older brother grew out of it. Wow, that's an amazing story. And then Tara has a second story here. The fairy. Question mark. This happened around the same age, but in a different house. And I had a bed, a bunk bed. Oh my fucking god. Get the fuck out of town. This is such beautiful synchronicity here. Synchronicity is something that I pay a lot of attention to. It's something that happens a lot in my life. This is a really fucking beautiful example listen to this this happened around the same age but in a different house and i had a bunk bed top bunk and shared a room with my little brother what the fuck are the chances of that i woke up with that similar hazy feeling but only to readjust and roll over as i rolled over I was met face to face with something staring at me, floating above me, only a few inches from the ceiling. Well, that's fucking terrifying. That's my absolute, like, nightmare. That's, if I would say that I have a phobia at all, it's of waking up and seeing a ghost literally right fucking in front of me. Like, face to face right in front of me. It looked like a small person, like the size of a cat. Oh, that's interesting. I, it looked female, pretty, very young. It had long hair that was floating around it. The being itself was emanating some sort of light or glow from around it. The room was no longer dark. It was suddenly like daylight in my room. Oh, that's amazing. The being was making soft noises. I think it was trying to speak to me. I was wide-eyed and my lip just started quivering. I let out a very shaky, inaudible cry for my mother. I pulled the covers up over my head and rolled over. I squeezed my eyes shut and just laid motionless for a few minutes. My heart pounding out of my chest. Yeah, I don't blame you. I finally gathered some courage to look, and my room was dark again. There was nothing there. I was upset by this incident, but not like when my bed shook. I seemed to get over this one much faster and didn't talk about it with my family. My nightmares and sleepwalking faded as I grew older. But these two memories are distinctly vivid and unexplainable to me. I'm not a good writer, so I apologize if this reads poorly. Thank you, Tara. No, that was actually very well written. 
that was one of the better better written stories that I've read on the podcast so much so far. So thank you very much, Tara, for that. For those two stories. Oh my god. We literally had three bed stories in a row with that top bunk, bottom bunk synchronicity. What a <laughs> What the hell was that? That was amazing. I um also slept walked a lot when I was younger. I would ask my parents about this sometimes. I can't really remember the last time I talked to them about it. <clears throat> and I I wonder about that because there does seem to be uh some sort of correlation between people that have different kinds of sleeping issues, be it Sleep paralysis, sleep walking, sleep talking, um, all those sorts of things that they also have some sort of connection to whatever the fuck is happening in the spirit, spirit world or whatever. Very interesting. Now, I hate to do this to completely out uh, this next submitter, but I have to roast you, bud. The guy's real name is Chad. <laughs> like actually Chad okay let's get in <laughs> sorry. sorry to make fun of you so anyways good day just call me Chad <laughs> oh my god he admitted it <laughs> no 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 I'm just roasting you I'm just roasting you uh, <laughs> thank you for submitting this story Chad uh, so there was a lot of stuff in here as I have had a lot of supernatural experiences growing up but I've never been too much of a believer in that kind of thing. Just like hearing about it. That's interesting. I would say that that's fairly much the, uh, pretty much the sentiment of a lot of my friends. Is that they're very curious about it, but they're not like a hands-on believer in any way. Uh, when I think back to those years growing up, it always gives me the creeps. Because I, because I can't explain these events other than ghosts or spirits, the house I grew up in was passed down in the family for four generations. Wow, that's really... In Excuse me. That's really interesting. Yeah, the concept of generational homes like that is really beautiful. I think, I think that, like, homes, buildings, structures should be built more sturdily like they used to be and handed down through families like they used to be. But that is a debate for another day. The town itself was pretty old, but tiny, with only a thousand people living there. Oh, that sounds very quaint. It used to be bigger back in the 1800s, but an F5 tornado in 1942 destroyed the business district and crippled the town. Holy shit, that's dramatic. Since then, the town has been dying. The town has been drying up, and there are a lot of abandoned buildings. God, that's tragic. I'm so sorry to hear that. There's also uh, restricted land in the north where only Native Americans are allowed to go called Medicine Mound. Oh, that's interesting. That adds a nice little ominous quality to your region. Let's start at the house. Around 10-ish... There is a hallway leading to the bathroom with a door leading to my room off to the right. I was walking to go to take a leak and saw an old woman folding clothes on my bed out of the corner of my eye. Wow, that's kind of cool. Where I, when I looked again, there was nothing. Later on, I recognized her in an old photo album as my great-grandmother. Ooh. The closet in my room would never stay shut overnight, even when locked. So that's really cool. I'm glad that I chose this story. I didn't know that I was going to get a family member uh, when I read the first couple lines of this, when I uh, put it up here. So that's a nice little correlation to what I was talking about here. The strangest was the knocking that would happen at midnight every night for a week. It always precedes a death in the family. Holy fucking shit. My dad told me it was the family coming to take them to the other side. It happened for my uncle 
two cousins, and my grandmother. Every time I would start, my dad would start calling people, asking how they were doing, and making us get dressed, clothes ready for a funeral. Oh my god. This is a very interesting story. <laughs> that almost sounds like, like a premise to like a Netflix show or something. Every time you hear knocking, you gotta get your funeral clothes ready. Someone in the family is dead. So it never failed to predict a death, and I never heard so much as a creaky floor in between. Wow, that's amazing. Now those damned hills. I've always heard stories from the old folks about the medicine mounds, from dancing lights to a town that burned to the ground after they tried building next to them. Wow, that's ominous. Holy shit. Around 16, me and my friend decided that it would be a fun time to test out our courage, and the view up there must be amazing. Well, I'm sure it was. I might allow that curiosity get to, to get to me too, especially in my teens. Holy shit. We regretted it as soon as we hopped up the fence. The scream was like... A kid being chased, mixed with a boar roaring. It was distant, but we both jumped back over and headed to the truck. I didn't look back, and when I grabbed the door handle, because whatever it was, gave me a reoccurring nightmare that kept going every few months for a few years, and I still, 20 years later, can't stand being in the dark outside. The thing was about as tall as the fence, which was about a six-footer, and the silhouette looked like a man in a trench coat with the collar up above his head. Its eyes, though, were the worst part. They were maybe softball size, and around where the chest should be, there was like two clusters of embers with the wind stoking them. Oh my fucking god. It felt like I was having every sin I'll ever commit being judged or like I was a bird poop that landed on someone's wedding cake. Those eyes will be the last thing I see before I die. I know it. Oh my fucking god. <laughs> that was one of the most fucking incredible stories I've ever heard. I gotta say though, if a gun to my head, I would categorize that as a skinwalker. Because it's a very nondescript spirit being. And the scream being terrifying. Uh, I bring that up in a lot of cryptid videos. Bigfoots, um, Wendigos, Skinwalkers. They all have this terrifying scream associated with them. Very much like a ghost. That almost sounds like somebody being tormented. And you'd think that that would trigger your defensive instincts to go and save whoever it is that's screaming but the thing is that the scream is in such a cadence that it actually triggers your fight or flight response and it makes you terrified it makes you want to run away and it's almost like that's a weapon that these spirit beings use to d deter you from entering these sacred spaces and i think that that's so amazing i think that there really is something to the idea that the natives know where these these like hot spots, these convergent points are where these things can appear. I really like the detail of it can see all your sins and into your soul. Very ominous. You're an amazing writer. Chad, I'm so sorry I made fun of you. No, I'm not sorry I made fun of you. That was hilarious. You guys know I'm just, I'm just teasing you, of course. I love these stories. So he finishes off by just saying, there's more to these that are more vivid memories. I argue with myself constantly about the crap I saw growing up, and I can't agree if this stuff was real or coincidental natural phenomenon. I 
really would rather that monster be nothing but a reflection of moonlight. God damn. Well, yeah, this this was definitely one of the better stories we've read on this series. Thank you so much, Chad. Absolutely amazing. I've got two more from a Jacob here, and I'm just about to sweat through my clothes. So I think I can get through these. Hey, Greg. My weird experience. Short, okay, long version. I was with a group of friends. We were together holding a small LAN party. L-A-N party. Love that. I'm a huge geek. Love LAN parties. I think it was the World Championship of Football, soccer, to you Americans. They ended up in kickoff. Can't remember which countries, but Denmark, where I'm from, was not one of them. I casually sat down watching it with my buddies, I read the atmosphere of the crowd, how the goalkeeper looks and how the players doing the kicks look. I proceeded to do that with every kick. I call every single goal where the kicker kicks to the goal. The goalkeeper gets it. If the player misses completely, if the keeper gets a touch what they're saying is that he was able to predict every single outcome of every single kick, whether it was going to be saved, deflected, or like a clean goal. That's interesting. My friends, after the fifth goal or so, started looking at me with a strange look. They asked after the kicks how on God's green earth I could have done that. I don't know. I just did it. And then he says, uh, P.S. I can't wait for your final reveal on what you know. On the top of my bucket list is visiting the Giza Plateau. Well, that rhymed. You're a goddamn poet, too. <laughs> yeah, that episode is almost... Um, I'm going to start filming it very, very soon. Very fucking soon. It's got to get out soon, doesn't it? Um, you know what? I, can, I think I can suffer through this last story. Yeah, I already gave you guys a trigger warning near the beginning of this episode that it was going to be kind of depressing, so that still stands before this final story. On September the 6th, I told my mother if I would ever try to take my own life, this is how I would do it. She was, of course, shocked at what she heard that day. She was luckily not alone with me, though. With us, a friend of us, my mother and friend talked to me into admitting myself into psychiatric hospital. The biggest mistake we made, it was a free admission, not forced. Right, and that's the best kind. When you admit yourself freely, you can also check yourself out without much hassle. Easy to fake it if you make it, yes. Well, I think in most places, if you check yourself in, it doesn't matter what mental state you're in, you can just freely leave. My memories stop there, though. I cannot remember checking myself out on the 8th of September. I got transport to my mother's house, where I had my current temporary address and where my car was parked. I then, the next day, on the 9th of September, I start to remember, I cannot remember this, this is what I have been able to figure out from what other people saw and heard. I drove from my mother's house to visit my friend Jasmine in a different town. When visiting him, I apparently, in super mood, joked around and smoked some weed. And we always smoke weed together. It was a regular thing. There, my knowledge stops. From what I can figure out, I must have driven down to the place of the accident directly after. Now, before I tell you the story, let me give you another mindfuck. In 1984, two, and he says two years before he was born, his mother was in an accident on that exact same road. Wow. I was born in 1984. Which almost killed her, but somehow 
and some way she survived this accident and still lives to this day. I was born November the 6th, 1986. Back to my accident. Oh, wow. They've linked proof that this accident happened. It is in a foreign language. Dear God, there's no way I'm going to be able to understand this. But I will watch this video clip. Holy shit. Yep, that is a fucking accident. Oh my fucking God. How the hell did you survive this? You can barely tell that this is a car from some angles. Jesus Christ. Okay, sorry everybody. That was even more shocking than I expected. From what the police were able to figure out, I hit the tree at around 140 kilometers per hour. Holy shit. I had no seatbelt on, obviously. The good thing was I had not even, though I had the capability to find the knowledge needed, got somehow Jacob had disabled the airbag. I somehow sabotaged myself enough to give me a chance. I broke three to four vertebrae, several ribs, open femur frac. I'm not going to read all these. Oh my God, just lots and lots and lots. I was flown by helicopter to the University Health Hospital. During the flight, my heart stopped beating and I was revived successfully. I arrived and was immediately taken to surgery for a total of 10 hours. That's significant. After the long, extensive operation, they put me in a medically induced coma. After eight days, they slowly took me off the medication and kept me in the coma. The story is longer than this, but it can be shared if there is interest, he says. Well, thank you very much for that story, Jacob. That was very grim. I'm so happy that you did not die that day. Thank you for sharing your story. I'm sure everybody appreciated it. I'm going to check to see if we've got any more Super Chats, but my voice is toast for the night. I hope I managed to keep it sexy enough for everybody. Thank you for joining me tonight, everybody. Again, thank you to my patrons that are listening at home.